Hi folks, today we're going to have a look at the dynamics questions from the 2017 higher physics paper. So, question number one, a student is on a stationary train. The train now accelerates along a straight level track. The student uses an app on a phone to measure the acceleration of the train. A, the train accelerates uniformly, 0.32 meters per second per second for 25 seconds. State what is meant by an acceleration of 0.32 meters per second per second. So, this means that the velocity of the train changes by 0.32 meters per second every second. We have to notice that it does give a value in the question. Quite often you'll see questions that say something like state what is meant by an acceleration, full stop. And in that case, it would just be the change in velocity per second. But in this question, since the value is given in the question, we have to give the value in the answer as well. Part two, calculate the distance traveled by the train in 25 seconds. So this is a equations of motion question. And the easiest way to tackle these is to first write down SUVAT on the side of our page. Now, S is the distance. That's what we want to know. U is the initial velocity, and it's initially stationary. V is its final velocity. We don't know about that, and it's not relevant to the question. So A is acceleration, 0 0.32 meters per second per second. And T is the time, which in this question is 25 seconds. So we've got U, A, and T, and we want to know S. So we look on our data sheet for these letters, and we find this formula, S equals UT plus a half AT squared. We can insert the values that we have into that formula, and we get a value of 100 meters as the distance traveled by the train. Part B. Later in the journey, the train is travelling at a constant speed as it approaches a bridge. A horn on the train emits a sound of frequency 270 hertz. The frequency of the sound heard by a person standing on the bridge is 290 hertz. The speed of the sound in air is 340 meters per second. Calculate the speed of the train. Well, this is a Doppler effect question. And we're going to use the Doppler effect formula to work this out. Now, FO is the observed frequency. So that's the frequency that the person is hearing. FS is the frequency of the source. So the frequency of sound given out by the train in this case. V is the speed of sound, which is 340 meters per second. VS is the speed of the source, speed of the train in this case. Now, that's what we're trying to find out. The plus or minus sign is relevant to what direction the train is moving, whether it's moving towards us or away from us. Now, that's our FS, FO, and our V. So we put our numbers into the formula and we select negative for minus because the train is moving towards us. A couple of ways you can remember that if the train is moving towards us, we are subtracting diff distance from us to it. So minus. The other way to remember it, and this is how I remember, is I think of ambulances because ambulances are a, a good way of thinking about the Doppler effect because when they pass us, they go Nino, 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 Nino. And if an ambulance is coming towards us, that means. I'm injured, I'm ill. That is a negative thing. So coming towards us, negative. If the ambulance is going away, it means I'm all right. Somebody else is injured, but I'm all right. That's positive. So ambulance going away, positive. In this case, train's coming towards us, so it's negative. And that's the numbers in our formula. Now, this is quite a complicated formula to rearrange if we're trying to find out Vs. The first thing to do is to divide both sides by 270. 
and we end up with 290 over 270 equals 340 divided by 340 minus Vs. Now, Vs is the, the number we're trying to find out. If we're going to work out a number that's on the bottom of a fraction, that's quite complicated. It's much easier dealing with it if it's on the top of a fraction. So what I'm going to do is flip both sides of this fraction up the other way. So I get 340 minus Vs over 340 equals 270 over 290. Now, I'm going to multiply both sides by 340. And we end up with 340 minus Vs equals 270 over 290 times 340. Now, I need to subtract that 340 off both sides. And I end up with minus Vs equals 270 over 290 times 340 minus 340. And that gives me a value for Vs of 23 meters per second. Part two, the train continues to sound its horn as it passes under the bridge. Explain why the frequency of the sound heard by the person standing on the bridge decreases as the train passes under the bridge and then moves away. You may wish to use a diagram. Well, this is the sort of diagram I might draw. I can see my train moving towards the person and what's happening is the sound waves emitted by the train are compressed ahead of the train and are elongated behind the train. So as the train's moving towards us, the wavelength of the sound that we hear is shorter. So we hear a higher pitch. As the train's moving away, the wavelength of the sound that we hear is extended. So we hear a lower pitch. This doesn't mean that the frequency of the sound given out by the train changes at all. The frequency of the sound made by the train is constant. It's the frequency that we observe that changes. So this is what I've written. As the train moves towards the bridge, the wave fronts are compressed together ahead of the train. As it moves away, the wave fronts behind the train are stretched out. Question number two. A white snooker ball and a black snooker ball travel towards each other in a straight line. The white snooker ball and the black snooker ball each have a mass of 0 0.10 kilograms. Just before the ball, balls collide head on, the white ball is traveling at 2.6 meters per second to the right, and the black ball is traveling at 1.8 meters per second to the left. And we can see that in the picture. After the collision, the ba black ball rebounds with a velocity of 2.38 meters per second to the right. Determine the velocity of the white ball immediately after the collision. So, in these sorts of situations, I would always draw myself a little diagram of what's happening before and what's happening after. So before we know the white ball's moving to the left and the black ball to the right, then after, we don't know where the white ball's going, but we know the black ball's moving to the right. And I can put in the information that I know. I know the mass of the white ball, the mass of the black ball, and I know the initial speed of the white ball, 2.6 meters per second. The initial speed of the black ball is 1.8 meters per second, but it is to the left, and therefore we need to change the sign because it's moving in the opposite direction. So the initial speed of the black ball is actually minus 1.8 meters per second. And after, we don't know the speed of the white ball, that's what we're trying to find out. And the speed of the black ball is 2.38 meters per second. So, in any collision, the total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. So, this is the momentum of the white ball plus the momentum of the black ball before the collision equals the momentum of the white ball plus the momentum of the black ball after the collision. I put my numbers into that formula there. And I start working out some of the numbers to make life a little bit easier for myself. Then a little bit of algebra. And finally, an answer of minus 1.58 meters per second. That means the white ball has rebounded off the black ball and is now moving at 1.58 meters per second to the left. 
Part two, the collision between the balls is inelastic. State what is meant by an inelastic collision. So an inelastic collision is one where the total kinetic energy before the collision is greater than the total kinetic energy after the collision. B. A student carries out an experiment to measure the average force exerted by a cue on a ball. And there's a diagram of the experiment done there. The cue hits the stationary ball. The timer records the time the cue is in contact with the ball, and the computer displays the speed of the ball. The results are shown. Time of contact between the cue and the ball, 0 0.040 plus or minus 0 0.001 seconds. Speed of the ball immediately after contact, 0 0.84 plus or minus 0 0.01 meters per second. Mass of the ball, 0 0.18. 0 plus or minus 0 0.001 kilograms. Part 1. Calculate the average force exerted on the ball by the Q. An uncertainty in this value is not required. So, we're going to use our impulse formula. Ft equals mv minus mu. Force times time equals change in momentum. I put my numbers that I'm given in the, uh, in the question into that formula. Do a little bit of working out, a little bit of algebra, and I end up with a value of 3.8 newtons. Part two, determine the percentage uncertainty in the value of the average force on the ball. Okay, so we're given the uncertainty in all the values that are contributing to the average force. And at higher physics, when we're combining uncertainties, what we need to know is that the percentage uncertainty in the final answer is the largest percentage uncertainty in the contributing values. So let's have a look at these values. We have the uncertainty of each of the measurements. These are absolute uncertainties in different units. So we can't take them as absolute values. We have to work out their percentages. So the percentage uncertainty in the time of contact, I take my uncertainty, divide it by the actual value, multiply by 100, and I get 2.5%. For the speed of the ball, I get 1.2%. And for the mass of the ball, I get 0.56%. Looking at these values, I can see that the time of contact between the cue and the ball contributes the largest percentage uncertainty to this measurement at 2.5%. Therefore, the percentage uncertainty in the force is 2.5%. Number three, a ball is thrown vertically upwards. The ball is above the ground when it's released. And we can see there it's thrown upwards at a speed of 5.6 meters per second vertically. The graph shows how the vertical velocity of the ball varies with time from the instant it is released until just before it hits the ground. And we can see it initially is moving at 5.6 meters per second upwards and its velocity decreases to zero and then increases again as it reaches the ground. So from this graph, I can see it leaves the thrower's hand at 5.6 meters per second. After a period of time, its velocity is zero. That is when the ball gets to its highest point. And then the ball will accelerate back down again. And the point where it hits the ground, it's moving at 7.7 .7 meters per second downwards, hence negative 7.7. .7. The reason it's going faster when it hits the ground than it was when it left the thrower's hand is because it fell further than it was thrown upwards. Because on its way down, it went from its highest point, fell down past the thrower's hand and continued until it hit the ground. Calculate the time taken for the ball to reach its maximum height. So we're gonna use this graph here to work this out. And we're going to use our equations in motion. Now, S is the height. We don't know about that just now, so we'll just leave that. 
U is the initial velocity of the ball, which is 5.6 meters per second upwards. V is the final velocity of the ball when it gets to its maximum height, which is zero. A is the acceleration due to gravity, which is minus 9.8. It's minus because the acceleration due to gravity is acting downwards. The initial velocity is acting upwards. So they need to be of different signs. And T is what we want to know, the time taken to reach its maximum height. So we have U, V and A, we want to know T, so we're gonna use this formula here, V equals U plus AT. We're gonna put our numbers into the formula, do a little bit of rearranging, and achieve an answer of 0 0.57 seconds. Part two, calculate the distance the ball falls from its maximum height to the ground. So again, we're gonna use equations in motion. This time we want to know the distance it falls. Its initial velocity as it falls from its maximum height to the ground is zero. Its final velocity when it hits the ground is minus 7.7 .7 meters per second, because it's moving downwards as it hits the ground. The acceleration is minus 9.8 because it's still accelerating downwards. And the time, we don't know how long the ball takes to hit the ground because this graph isn't symmetrical. It takes less time to get to its maximum height than it to reach the ground because it falls further than it goes upwards. So now we have S, U, V, and A. So using the formula V squared equals U squared plus 2AS, we can put in the values that we have. And again, a bit of algebra to rearrange and we achieve a final S of minus 3.025. Now the minus in this case means that the ball ends up, its final displacement is three meters below where it started. That's what the negative indicates. So the ball fell downwards three meters. B, the ball is now thrown vertically upwards from the same height with a greater initial velocity. Add a line to the graph below to show how the vertical velocity of the ball varies with time from the instant it is released until just before it hits the ground. The effects of air resistance can be ignored. So, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to end up with a graph that looks a bit like this. The initial velocity of the ball is going to be greater. It's thrown with a greater velocity than 5.6. But it's still going to be acted on by the same acceleration due to gravity. So the ball's going to slow down at the same rate as it goes up into the air. So the slope of our line needs to be the same as our previous line. It is going to take longer to get to its maximum height. and it's going to take longer to come back down again, therefore. And because it's fallen from a higher height, its final vertical velocity is also going to be greater. And that is the end of the dynamics questions from the 2017 higher paper. I hope you found these useful and I hope you come back and listen to some more.